the you know federation distributed systems all this sort of stuff but i think we also need to be thinking about the organizations behind what we were doing so rather than just the technology or the code itself the organizational structures that we choose to use behind what we're doing um and obviously i'm slightly biased in that but yeah bosses suck um, we don't need them. Uh, <laughs> sorry if you're a boss. You shouldn't be. Quit. <laughs> Change your business into a workers' co-op. Um, but yeah, so if you're not familiar, a workers' co-op is a business or some sort of collective thing that is like part of its constitution or its rules is that it is like held in common between the people that are involved in the project. So many of you are probably already involved in a lot of stuff already that has this structure. Maybe you're just not calling it a cooperative or you, you know, there's many other words for it. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I'd also like to propose that uh, in the tech industry, um, we should be thinking about these structures. And um, yeah. If you are interested in finding out more about the stuff, there's a massive network of tech co-ops which look more like sort of traditional, uh, well, they can look like more sort of traditional tech companies in the UK. Um, we're called Cooperative Technologists, and our website is coops.tech. Um, there's about 32, including many that are based in London, some people who are in this organization who are here today. Um, and yeah, let's try and take that conversation a little bit further maybe later. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Simon, um, and I want to talk very briefly about decentralized common standardization. Uh, what's the challenge? And I've made notes so I don't go run over time. So it's really two, three issues. Why standards are vital to a decentralized web and to decentralization more generally. Uh, what are the big problems we're facing? And how we might approach doing something more constructive. Now, for, how it, for number three, you'll have to come to our session. But uh, so I'll just do one and two. So uh, what's the problem? So firstly, um, why are standards and interoperability vital to decentralization? Uh, I think probably you all agree with this, but what would happen if we didn't have GSM, HTML, HTTP? I mean, we all just live, they're so obvious that we don't even realize what they are, that we realize that they're there. And my, my sense is that we will need more commons-based interoperability standards, more, not less, as we dismantle the power structures which could have imposed central standards. So that's my kind of basic idea. Sure, some standards have worked fine in the past. Let's not chuck those away. Um, and there are two, I'm, I'm going to just outline two big problems just for you to think about. One um, is an organizational factors and the second is personal factors. The first organizational factors. Who has actually worked on, an inter, uh, on a standardization committee? Wh which ones? Briefly shout them out, yeah? Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. So within within what body? W3C or? Okay. W3C. 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 Has anybody worked with? Okay, right. Well, anybody worked with ISO or? or yeah, okay. Okay, so the problems really, first the problem, the standards world, BSI, SEN, ISO, the sort of official stat, they've got it. Do you know what they're pressing? They work bureaucratically. They don't have open processes. They sell copies of standards. It's not free or open. No, it's a real problem. W3C done lots of great essential work, but for example, they are criticised for um, uh, following big business interest, EFF resignation in 2017, for example. None of these things are, are free from abuse by money. Second, personal factors. Lots of people involved in standardisations are great, do excellent work, I'm sure you will do. However, some people are paid for by their businesses, so that's not, they're not going to be able to be um, impartial. And the other thing, the other problem I found is that other people are experts and they may find it difficult to see other people's point of view. In my experience, it's rare to find standards people who have a good training in consensus working. That's a real personal issue. Um, so, you know, too many of the people haven't developed a mindset which, will, which enables efficient and effective collaboration. So we want up-to-date, technically good standards and protocols governed by the commons, governed by commons, to meet as many needs of people and businesses as possible, especially for open, decentralised platforms and co-ops. 
But how do you want to do it? Well, I don't know. If you want to participate, you, you know part of the answer. Come to our session and talk about it. And uh, I just want to talk briefly about decentralized identity and kind of where we're at with it. Uh, I say we rather presumptuously. I don't presume to speak for the whole community. But um, I want to make you aware that there is one. And since identity is kind of a thread that runs through a lot of uh, movements towards decentralization, um, just sort of want to let you know what else is, is going on out there. So um, this was sort of first started becoming a more mainstream conversation at the uh, Internet Identity Workshop. Uh, has anybody here been to that event? Yeah, it's freaking awesome, right? It's run in this format. It's an open space thing. Uh, it's been running for 14 years. Uh, the one that happened a couple of weeks ago had 300 attendees, which was amazing. And back in 2015, some people started saying, uh, look, there's a lot of interest in, uh, in, in blockchain and kind of getting decentralized networks to scale. Maybe we could apply that to identity. A lot of people said they were crazy. We've got OAuth. That will work really well. Um, you know, fast forward to today, and uh, like I said, 300 attendees at IIW, about half the sessions devoted to uh, practical applications of decentralized identity. Um, you've got the Decentralized Identity Foundation, uh, started two years ago. Um, of, all, of all people, it was a Microsoft executive that actually found the, the initial founding money for that, but they've now got something like 60, uh, 60 members from uh, all across industry and, uh, and nonprofit in there. Um, and then there are, uh, there are groups that are actually sort of running, uh, running networks to bring this about. So there's uh, Hyperledger, uh, has no less than three uh, decentralized identity projects happening there. Um, a group that I was involved in this genesis of called the Sovereign Foundation uh, runs a uh, public network for decentralized identity that now has 70 organizations called stewards that are running nodes. And they're decentralized in terms of geography, jurisdiction, and vertical markets. So big companies like IBM and Cisco and teeny nonprofits and the Red Cross and all kinds of folks doing that. Um, and there's uh, a real move towards standardization. So these things aren't, aren't trying to all fragment and go off in different directions. You've got the W3C, which despite their, uh, their foibles mentioned earlier, um, are really trying to say, look, we screwed up. The web should have had identity from the get-go. Let's try and fix this. Um, and so there's two standards under development there, one for decentralized identifiers, right? So IDs that uh, you don't rent from a telco or an email provider or whatever, you truly own and can cryptographically prove are yours. Um, and another for verifiable credentials, so a way that you can take these, uh, you know, whether they're government issued or self-attested, these sort of physical documents that we rely on all the time um, about yourself in a number of different contexts. So you've got a move towards standardization, you've got a community of people working on it, you've got a vibrant uh, set of open source projects, not just a hyperledger, you've got Uport building on Ethereum, you've got uh, Microsoft made a big contribution to the thing called SideTree. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on, um, and I suspect it's involved in some of your work, or if it isn't, should be. So um, I'm going to be geeking out about this all day, um, and I hope to sort of plant that seed. And if some of you want to talk to me, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, this is a bit tall. <laughs> Can I move? Perfect. Uh, I, I can do my ballerina pointy feet, but not for three minutes. Uh, and, and my plays are awesome. You should check them. Well, I'm here originally to talk about an add-on I built by f to, for Firefox. But I wondered, who here has heard of Secure Scuttlebutt? Oh, so I can actually talk about the add-on because I was thinking like, mm, maybe people don't know it. So uh, my name is Andre. I go by Soap Dog because teenage decisions on nicknames are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm building an add-on for Firefox that's a secure scuttlebutt client inside the browser because there is no point in building a decentralized web and throwing the current web on the bonfire. Like, we need bridges. We need our user agents, the browser, to go where we want them to go. And if we want to go to a decentralized world, we need the browser to come with us. We need to be able to link 
from decentralized protocols such as Scuttlebutt, IPFS, that into the normal web and back. And to do that, we need the add-ons. So I'm personally building PatchFox. You are welcome to reach me after this talk and take a look into it. I hope it doesn't explode. And later we are having a Scuttlebutt onboarding session. So I can show you uh, the apps that you can install. We can onboard you because our main friction point right now is onboarding. So if you're curious about it, don't miss it because we can make onboarding a pleasant experience. Thanks a lot for having me here. And who's next? Oh. Can you give two sentences about what Scuttlebutt is for anyone who doesn't know? Yes, I can. So Secure Scuttlebutt is an offline first decentralization platform. We build a social network on top of it. And we build like NPM registries, Git registries. We can basically use it to build anything. What it is, it works like gossip. Uh, you carry all your data on your device, you carry all your friend's data on your device, and you carry all your friends of friends' data on your device, which means you can be flying over the Atlantic with years' worth of social graph data on your machine, liking cat photos, exchanging vegan junk food recipes as if the internet was there, but it isn't. <laughs> when you reach a friend, it will gossip, it will sync all that data, and eventually reach the rest of the network. So if the future brings us to a Mad Max kind of reality, Scuttlebutt will be really helpful. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Good morning. So, uh, so I'm Sarvan. Uh, I work on the SOLID project, short for sol uh, Social Link Data. Some of you may have heard of it, or we were here also in 2015? Yeah? 2015. Right. And uh, so I'm here to talk about or share exchange ideas around this project. If you're not familiar with it, um, it's just it's a project around uh, how, you can, how people can control their own data, who can access it, and how can they distribute that access. Um, so I'll, I'll just ask you a question, uh, or make a statement, and then ask you whether you agree or disagree. It's kind of a general, but let's see. So uh, data on the web should not be locked into particular systems or be only readable by the applications which created it. Users should be free to switch between applications and share data between them. If I think that covers uh, pretty much, I think, uh, most of what we're all working on or towards, aiming towards. But I think what I'm, or what we're partly interested in is also making sure that the, not just the technology that we're coming out with, but the, uh, the solutions, whether they're ethically grounded and how they tie in with the rest of the standards on the web. So I think other, others uh, have already mentioned how we can bridge uh, standards because there are you know, standards everywhere and they're coming from different communities, people with different backgrounds or interests, agendas. And so somehow we need to also, part of the, what makes the web web is it's social, so we need to uh, be more social about it and how do we uh, go about that. So happy to share exchange around this um, project. Thanks. Um, I was just going to say, who, who here has actually heard of Solid or used it? Well, look at that. I feel like what a famous project. Um, and one of the things that's kind of interesting about Solid is it's like a personal data store uh, helping people use their, their, you know, own control their data. There's lots of different interesting personal data stores. Um, I wrote about personal data stores in a blog post where I was mean, and I apologize. <laughs> See that? Um, yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on the Mad Max piece, um, and I'm going to talk about something quite different. Um, I come from a technology background, but I haven't actually done any coding or built any systems for a long time because I kind of do economics and policy type stuff. Anyway, um, what I'm here to talk about or just want to share a little bit about is um, about system change in the context of the climate crisis um, uh, and the work I'm doing in this space at the moment and how, and, and the reason this is relevant is, for example, 
you know, we all hear about energy transition, we need to change our energy systems. The fundamental thing that we need to do with a lot of these things is decentralize them and think about them in a different way. Um, a lot of the talks that I give talk about our digital ecosystem as one of the key tools to enable this, to empower this, to change the way we do economics, to change the way we do energy um, transactions and trade. Um, so the project that I'm working on is actually focuses at a global level. I think there's a lot of good people who are doing a lot of good things at a local level, at a city level. You know, there's a lot of people um, very strongly engaged. I know I probably should have asked for a show of hands as to who even believes in climate change here. Um, I'm, hoping, I'm hoping I've got a good audience here, but you, you never know. You, you come into audiences and you get heckled because people say well, it's all nonsense. Anyway, um, so I'm trying to do something because I think the UN and the UNFCCC, which is the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, have a m fundamental problem. Um, and climate change is a global thing, like the atmosphere, and we're not going to fix it unless we address it also at a global level. Um, I have a framework and a, and a published, peer published, peer reviewed paper that has an economic model which can start that ball rolling. It's kind of a wedge. It's not going to fix the, all of the world's economics or all of the decentralization problems, but it's a, it's a start. Um, I've modeled this, and what I thought could be useful, or you know, what I've been speaking to a lot of the people who are helping me with the communications and how to build communities and how to try and get um, people engaged on this um, framework that I've built. And by the way, the framework's called Dracula, just so that you don't forget it. Uh, um, the, the thing that we, we were thinking about is, is to try and find a way to gamify it. Uh, I know gamification is something that a lot of people go, go about, but, but the idea is that, is, is that this is a more efficient way of different countries uh, um, uh, dividing up, um, taking and owning responsibility for portions of the problem and, um, um, and, and helping solve it. So uh, my framework has both competitive, which I think is necessary because some people want to compete, and collaborative incentives in the way they build it. And what I wanted to try and do is try and find a way to gamify that so that people can start playing it, so that people can start engaging with it and trying to solve climate change themselves if the world order worked slightly differently, if the economics worked slightly differently. And I envisage this as potentially being the starting point of uh, um, a, a, a sort of digital ecosystem that starts with gamifying, um, gathers data, uses data, enables other people to engage with this subject uh, and start building an ecosystem, start building a, a community of interest, a distributed communities of interest that are trying to target different elements of it. If at the end of the day Dracula gets found out to be the, the crap version and, and there's a better economic framework or whatever, that's great by me. I just want to sort of get the ball rolling. Um, I had a bunch of slides, but I think better to just talk about it and if anybody wants to come and talk to me. I'm also open to, we don't have to do the gamification, if somebody just says, well, actually what you really need to do is communicate this better, then that's great. Thank you very much, everyone. My name is Sasha. I'm going to try to be short. Uh, hi, I'm Jack. Um, the thing I want to kind of uh, move in here uh, is the thing why I actually appeared in here. So this red decentralized movement and all, it's super nice. Um, but uh, let's say if we ask this business kind of question, uh, so what is in it actually for the end user? I mean, we've got the privacy right kind of argument and the resilience against the monopolies. But like, what else can we actually offer to the end user? Like, can we provide, uh, propose any like features that the current monopolies um, don't uh, don't give us um, like that, that's the reason I qu I came here like I quit my job two months ago actually I flew in here uh, because I got pissed like why these uh, clients I use they don't give me any uh, possibility to choose the content that is given to me like why do I have to open different apps why cannot I publish it to uh, like once um, there is uh, problems with moderation right it's not transparent it's like every silo has their own moderation and then like um, so it's either terrible or it's uh, kind of we don't know how it is. And so how can we, maybe we could make it kind of open so the user is able to, to choose what he actually reads. And so like all of these ideas, can we have more of them? Uh, maybe we can actually come up with like specific ideas, features that are useful for the user. And, uh, and so later on when, uh, when we, maybe they're not possible at this moment, right, because of some uh, privacy policies like the API is closed and so on, but if we have those ideas, maybe it's going to be easier to pitch them uh, to, 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 to re regulate those ideas. And uh, so, yeah, of course, it also relates to, to the bridge idea, which means, uh, okay, we can uh, build uh, alternatives for social media, and it's a good start, definitely a good start. But, uh, 
maybe we should also think more and, and think about, okay, how we can actually make it usable for the end users so they don't have to leave the current platforms and also use the new ones. Thanks. I am Harsha or Will from the Matrix area over there, and I am basically Mr. Bridges in that area. Go closer to the microphone. Hello, everyone. So uh, on, that topic, on that topic, we are basically developing platforms which let you bridge in your Slack, your Twitter, your IOC, anything you like, into one platform with one standard. And it's fantastic, because it basically means if your organization uses Slack, you can just leave it alone and use your own thing. All that kind of thing is perfect for our use case, and it means you can retain your own data, your own rights, that kind of stuff. Uh, and I'm quite passionate about, you know, retaining the rights to own your own conversations and not have some organization pull it out from underneath you because they've hosted it somewhere else. So on that topic, I think it's quite an interesting thing. All I really want to say is we're going directly into that topic later as a talk and we're going to discuss how do we do bridges, how do we... I'll just project to the audience and then someone can hear it on the web. Uh, so yeah, this is fundamentally what we're going to talk about later, about how do you make bridges, how do you make people use, a, um, use the platform you want to use, how do you integrate everyone and keep everyone on board with your stuff. Uh, finally, on the standardized thing, the way I think we can compete with the whole user end use experience is by adding features at a faster rate and improving, having more collaboration. And because it's an open platform, you can get different perspectives from different people. And you're not having one person say yes or no to these features because you're an open platform. You can just sort of increase your feature level and make you people want to use your stuff purely by being an open standard, I think. I'm rambling, but that's more or less the point of what we'll do later. Thanks. <laughs> So my name is uh, Michael. I just wanted to talk to you about. Uh, <laughs> a project I've been working on. Um, who here is using uh, GitHub or GitLab and doesn't have some sort of uh, may? What happens if feeling? <laughs> um, so. Uh, Right. So uh, the the project has be, uh, been working on is uh, called Gitbug. is uh, It's a distributed bug tracker that's uh, embedded in Git. Uh, so uh, what that means is that if you are using Git, if you have a, a Git repository and a Git remote, you can have a bug tracker for free. Uh, it's distributed, so you just uh, push your bugs to your, your, uh, re uh, your remotes, and you can collaborate with other people like this. Uh, it works offline because all of your uh, bug issues are uh, in your uh, repo. Uh, it prevents vendor locking because, well, you're not dependent on, on them anymore. Uh, it's fast. Everything is local, so um, reading uh, an issue is a matter of uh, milliseconds if it's the end of uh, doing a web request. Um, it doesn't pollute your project. Uh, you can work as usual. Uh, Gitbug is just using uh, Git as a sort of transport and a database. It doesn't uh, conflict with your uh, usual file. Um, it integrates with your tooling. Uh, you, you can use uh, the interface you want. There is a common line uh, interface. There is a, a interactive terminal UI, and there is a web UI. I will show you. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there is uh, bridges with uh, GitHub and GitLab, so you can import your issue and pull your issue while you are working on it. Uh, so that's the command light tools and the terminal, interactive terminal UI, it's like this. Uh, you can use uh, whatever uh, text editor you want. I use Nano because because. <laughs> um, there's also a web UI. You can start locally and work on it. 
uh, still a bit crappy. So if you want to work on it, contact to me. Um, <coughs> what else? Um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> <laughs> Always the mirroring. Arrangements, mirror. Sorry, that's the classic like uh, three hardest problems in computer science, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, take it. <laughs> hey, look at that. Um, okay. right, do you have the I do. Um, I tweeted it at Radio Center. Okay, so we're gonna offer it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, Twitter yeah, has mentioned. locked me out. So I, uh, I oh, that's a great segue. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, Serena. All right, my name is Tontek. Uh, the dot com is silent. Um, I'm also at T on Twitter when it's not blocked. <laughs> this is my website. Uh, I figured I would show more than tell as far as I could. Uh, I have been posting on my own site instead of Twitter uh, for almost 10 years now, since 2010, because I got very frustrated with them about 10 years ago and built my own stack with a bunch of folks. Um, Literally every note I posted on my site is here. This is like no big deal these days. People use things like Mastodon instead. Um, so of course I do things like also post replies. Um, but in addition, I can post replies to tweets and I, that's for my site. And the site posts it automatically to Twitter and threads it. So I don't need to like have everyone on my system in order to interact with them, which I think is a really important principle of anything decentralized is composability and bridging. Um, and it's never an either or. We should always try to bridge across systems. Um, so that's the principle there. Uh, also photos. Um, again, you've seen lots of things that post uh, federated decentralized photos. Uh, the key is you want to be able to also have folks that follow you on other systems, like Twitter, also post them, also see them wherever they want to see them, without me having to use Twitter's UI and deal with uh, you know, all the toxicity there. Um, what about events? So events, I, I claim, should be decentralized as well. Um, I post this to my own site, and then there's a copy on Twitter, and then you can add it to your calendar if you use some other calendaring system. Again, all these things work via standards like ICS, iCal, existing standards. Um, we just saw uh, decentralized uh, Git issues. Well, what if you use your own site to post issues instead? I would claim that you should own all your own issues, not put it on someone else's decentralized site. Um, because you can, of course, post a copy automatically to wherever they're aggregating it as well, whether that's on GitHub or somewhere else. And all of this works um, via services like Bridgie that can handle all this for you. Like I didn't need to write to GitHub's API and all those others to make that work. I was able to use a service and an open standard called WebMention, a W3C recommendation. Um, this is one of about a half dozen recommendations that the Social Web Working Group published uh, and is out there working um, test suite, dozens of implementations for peer-to-peer uh, sharing out there. Uh, there's many more, uh, spec.indieweb.org if you want to see a bunch of the building blocks there. Um, if you want to get started with your own personal site and like how do you actually join and federate and all that, indiewebify.me. There's of course a chat channel, like every other uh, awesome project here, uh, chat.indieweb.org, except there's a little bit different here is that we've actually bridged this to Matrix, of course. Um, you can use Matrix, you can use Discourse, you can use IRC if you're old school. That's where we started. Um, that's our canonical copy as well. Or Slack, even. So all that works. You can see, even though this is an IRC archive, you have icons. Which brings me to the last thing, which is we also hold events which, in, which work in person because we really believe in the human value of connection. Um, Indie Web Camp Berlin 2 is coming up. 
November 23rd and 24th. Tickets are complimentary. Uh, if you're in Europe, we encourage you to come to that. If you're in the States, we encourage you to come to Indie Web Camp San Francisco, December 7th and 8th. So, um, any questions? I don't think we're talking about it. Yeah. Hi everyone. Okay, so this will be a, a quick one because it was a last minute decision to do it. So um, uh, I think uh, in the future we're going to need more identities. Uh, and so my theory is that passwords are essentially a blocker to us getting to this future. You know, in our brain we're limited to how many we can remember. And so I've come here because I'm interested in almost any technology that allows us uh, to use an alternative method. Um, and I wanted to basically give a shout out to, uh, so I've set up forgetpasswords.com. Uh, it's a forum where I've started discussing these issues, looking for almost any, anything, any solution in that area. Uh, some of the sort of social benefits of being able to have multiple identities. Um, and so check it out if that is also interesting to you. All right, so this will be a little bit more on the philosophical end. I'm going to really quickly ask all of our speakers to close your eyes. Okay, everybody else, on the count of three, how many fingers am I holding up? Three, two, one. Five. All right, speakers, you can open your eyes. How many fingers was I holding up? Three. <laughs> so smart. All right, so basically information is always in form. You're hearing my voice right now because there's sound waves propagating through the room, and that's the form of that information. You're able to hear it, however, because you have an eardrum that's flexing when those sound wave hits it. Your body is literally changing shape. You are being transformed. We're able to experience information only when we experience transformation. Kind of crazy, right? Well, you were able to experience the information, the light coming off of my fingers, even though they weren't. But you did something useful for them. You were able to transform that information from the form of light into the form of sound, which they did have access to, because though their eyes were closed, their ears were not. Right? So this is kind of an interesting thing. Unfortunately, we're not able to be responsive or receptive to all forms of information. It takes effort to build up a capacity to, to receive something. So I'm good with sound. I'm really bad with radio waves. How do living systems, how do natural systems deal with this? Well, they delegate to others, right? Just like happened here, we delegated the transformation of information. They delegated to you that transformation. We see that in the natural world all the time. Cows delegating to grass the useful transformation of carbon dioxide and water into glucose, okay? Um, so there's agents that are bridging. This is kind of the difference between a network and an ecosystem. We often talk about centralized, decentralized, distributed networks. But in those networks, if you're not actually changing the form, it doesn't, you, you can get something there. But there's something richer that happens when agents are able to receive information in one form and transform it into another. That's actually the key to an ecosystem. And so what I'm really wanting to talk about today is that this, the key that difference plays in generating value or enabling us to benefit from interacting with one another. How does a beehive explore territory? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about that through this concept of holographic storage. Holographic is this idea that uh, we perceive of the everything that's before us, but only the parts that we're able to, only from our own perspective. In other words, we're scarred by our own experiences, right? If we're scarred only by the things that we can, that we experience, then we don't, we don't have the information that everybody else did. But we can interact with them and they can share information with us and we get better for it. So beehive, you have bees going off in a whole bunch of different directions and one wanders off this way and it doesn't find any pollen. And it comes back to the hive all tired, but it sees another bee do a little dance. And that indicates, oh, that bee had gone this way and found pollen it brought back useful information. It noticed, hey, I found something, it came back, it 
left a signal. This newbie goes, oh, maybe I should go look over there. It goes over there and explores in that territory, and when it comes back, yeah, I found pollen too, and does a little dance, and the next bee is able to, to learn from that. The cost that that first bee bore when it went and failed was small. That bee's effort got lost. But when we find something valuable, that's able to be passed on, and if the next party finds it valuable, they can pass it on as well. The key thing here is that in these dis in distributed systems, or systems with holographic storage, we get the most learning for the least cost. The problem that, the whole point that I want to make here is this. Often with centralization, we think that the issue is corruption or power imbalances or something like that. And I think it's actually this, that there's a huge learning disability that centralized systems have. They don't fail cheaply enough, so they're not able to explore broadly enough. They don't have the vitality. The problem with centralized systems is they actually redu reduce the aliveness of our systems. Thank you. Okay, so we are about to start calling sessions, and our first session is at 12. Um, before we do that, I, uh, I'm just super aware that we've just had a whole series of lightning talks by a bunch of men, so I'm going to give a lightning talk. Woo! Uh, if, uh, if any other uh, people who don't identify as men would like to do a quick talk, please, please come forward. Um, so, really quickly, one of the things that I do is translate between uh, technologists and non-technologists, often policy people, government people, um, that's the kind of area where I sit. And one of the things that I'm finding really interesting is like we've reached a point where everyone's like, oh man, Facebook, you know, something's got to be done. Something, something has got to be done. Facebook is evil. You know, did you, did you see like uh, Mark Zuckerberg being questioned about when he found out about Cambridge Analytica um, by the awesome AOC, whose exact name I don't remember, but her Twitter name is AOC. And it's really amazing, and suddenly we've got people saying, let's break up big tech, we've got, to, we've got to do something. You know, There is a desire to regulate, but actually what people are proposing isn't very innovative, isn't very interesting. I mean, just fine, if Facebook loses Instagram and WhatsApp, that's not going to, that's not actually going to protect people's privacy. That's not actually going to change the fact that a fifth of the entire world's population, 1.6 billion people, log in daily, daily, into a platform that whole business model is trying to keep you hooked and, you know, like selling your data for, for advertising and selling your attention. That's kind of terrible. And so one of the things that I've been talking to a lot of people about and thinking about is how can we explain to regulators um, and policy people that there's more that we can do. We can start looking at interoperability, breaking big tech open. So um, maybe some of you guys have seen, I wrote about this a couple of week ba weeks back, and it's actually getting a huge amount of interest uh, from policy people. So I think we need to start talking about so, so some of these standards, um, whether it's decentralized identity, activity pub, other things, how can we actually make Facebook use these standards or at the very least open up their APIs to make it possible to break their monopoly and ensure that when people use alternatives, whether it's Scuttlebutt or Matrix or something else, they don't lose con you know, their social network and their contacts and they can still be invited to events or invite people to events and essentially maintain that social graph and interoperability. So that's something that I'm really, really interested in, especially taking to a more sort of political campaign level. Uh, there's quite a few organizations that are actually really excited about it. And if anyone else or any other organizations institutionally want to support this effort, um, then please come talk to me. My name is Ira. Thank you. Thank you.